Welcome back to the live stream. This week we've got Kahal Moran, one of the founders of Rethinking Economics. We're going to be talking about how you ought to learn economics. Be kind, stay safe, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Stephen Friends. Uh, today we've got a, a guest, Dr. Kahal Morin, and we're going to be delving into the fascinating uh, intersection, if I'm going to come up with a word, between behavioral science and economics. Now, I, I, I realize that the title of today's show is Unlearning Economics, but I, I think what I've been able to glean um, about um, Dr. Moran's book, our, our um, research, is that he's he's heavily weighted into the area of behavioral science and that intersection between economics. Um, we're going to bring Steve in in a minute, but what I'd like to actually prep Steve with is kind of the directions that we want to steer the show. I mean, I, I'm I'm actually what comes to mind when it for me when when we think about behavioral economics, I think um, of of Kahneman and the uh, the the fast thinking and the slow thinking. Um, the role of emotions in both rational and irrational behavior. These are, are very interesting topics and I, I'm hoping to get um, some clarification and some discussion from the guests and not only, not only our guests, but also Mike Radzicki and also Steve Keen. Um, so with that, I think now it's time to bring on Steve Keen. Let's, let's see what he's been up to and, and, and see if this is a uh, an appropriate entry into today's conversation. Steve, why don't you join us? Hi, guys. Yep. So, well, I've just been mentioning I've done, I've just finished my new book called uh, Rebuilding Economics from the Top Down. And that actually partially answers your query because the reason I say top down is I don't think it's particularly, and this, Carl, Carl and I might have a bit of a, a chat here on this front, I don't think there's much point in trying to build economics from the bottom up. I don't think we need to look at individual behavior so much. Uh, we need to look at the economic structures and basically herd behavior far more so than individual. Mm, interesting. I'll elaborate on that uh, as we talk, yeah. If, and, and it's all fresh in your mind with your book, right? Um, mm -hmm. But would you say that the role of the, of the bottom up could be more just educational about the top down? I mean, I, I, I I, something that comes to mind is in a um, an exclusive top down scenario. It, it, it's it's uh, I'm I'm going to use the word oppressive. It's like it's not a bi directional, undemocratic. Like I know these are not these are not um, you know valid uh, I guess objections, but they are things that kind of come to mind and would probably spark in the minds of people that that to try and parse what you're saying before reading your book like what is this top down sort of approach does it mean authoritarian does it mean um no right? <laughs> it, it means forget about micro i mean for a start the, if you looked at the last quarter quarter millennium of economic uh, research economic theory it's almost all of it started from talking from the bottom up um mm -hmm. you have uh, you know smith was talking about the behavior of the ind individuals um, certainly, neoclassical economics would be nothing but the so-called behavior of individuals. And when we reason, we talk about it, you know, the representative firm, the representative agent, all this sort of shit from neoclassical theory. And it's become ingrained in economists to think they have to start reasoning at the, at the individual level. But the problem with that is that when you try to aggregate, it falls over. Um, so what neoclassicals have done is make some of the craziest assumptions ever made. And I'm happy to quote some of them from my book. Uh, in, mm. in, in today's talk, but ludicrous stuff to get over the fact that if you start at the individual level, you are below the level at which economic behavior emerges. So mm -hmm. fundamentally, 
uh, the, the behavior of the macroeconomy is the emergent result of interactions of numerous individuals, but the emergence can't be found in the actual any isolated individual. And that's the way in which uh, uh, the model falls over. And I completely disagree with economics in one lesson here about uh, wanting to use superposition. I think that's part of the problem. I know what superposition is from my mathematical training. Uh, it may be appropriate in some ways. I'd be highly unlikely to see it working. And it's far simpler to start at the level of macroeconomic definitions, which is what the book is based on, and showing you can build quite a realistic macroeconomics out of very simple macroeconomic definitions. I've I've lost the uh, what is the super, what is superposition? What, what how is he using it in the context the the chatter? Well, I'll let me let economics one lesson talk about it because he's obviously worked in the area more than I have. But oh, fundamentally, it says you can actually separate superposition. It means in, in many ways you can basically, in a sense, adding up, being able to structure stuff. Um, oh, you, you, okay, you okay. see. Uh, linear, linear models can be super can be superpositioned on top of each other. You can take apart the components. Nonlinear models cannot, and that's what yeah. makes me rather skeptical because I see the economy as fundamentally nonlinear. So superposition goes against what I see as the the basis of how the economy actually operates. So there's a uh, like a phenomenal or like an emergent uh, phenomenon that emerges in a macro environment that doesn't translate to the bottom. Uh, and yeah, it doesn't add like, like, up, right? Like, here's here's my favorite emergent property: water. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what does water consist of? Two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. Hydrogen yeah. freezes at about minus, you know, two hundred and seventy degrees, and oxygen freezes about minus two hundred and sixty. And this stuff freezes. This stuff freezes at zero and becomes gaseous at, a, at a, above one hundred degrees Celsius. So how do you put together, you know, two atoms? That are gases at two hundred minus two hundred and seventy and two hundred and sixty, and get the ones that gas at plus one hundred. Uh, now, then you've got to go into the the properties that come out. Of, and then the, the way water behaves. I mean, water is the craziest stuff on the planet. If water wasn't, of course, the planet, we wouldn't be here either. But the way in which water behaves is crazy. Uh, things like you know, getting a getting a meniscus, so you can have water above the glass because surface yeah. tension occurs which is not a common phenomenon in most liquids. It gets lighter when it freezes. Its solid form is less dense than its liquid form. That's also extremely unusual. If that didn't happen, again, life wouldn't exist on the planet. We would have frozen from the bottom of the oceans up and it'd be a ball of ice. Uh, so there's so many things about what we take for granted, which come out of emergent pr properties. And the, one of the greatest works in terms of a conceptual foundation for looking at complex systems was done by Philip Anderson, who a, has a PH, has a Nobel Prize, a genuine one in physics. Okay, so he mm -hmm. contributed to physics sufficiently to be given a Nobel Prize in the topic, and he wrote a wonderful paper called "More Is Different," and points mm -hmm. out that you cannot derive a high level. Uh, operation like macroeconomics, as I say, from a lower level of micro. He gives the example and says that uh, psychology is not applied biology, for example. Okay, and said so at each level you get new behaviours, which will give you a fundamentally diff different form of analysis mm -hmm. to lower levels. So that's why I think there's been far too mm -hmm. much belief by economists that they can derive everything from the bottom up, and therefore they obsess about individual behaviour without realising its emergent properties. That you can probably, you know, you can multi, you can you can do it in a multi-agent model, if you're a very sophisticated programmer. Um, but it, but it's an enormous amount of work. So I'm saying, look, throw that wrong direction out of out the window. Work from the top down, and you'll get a much more rapidly get to a much more realistic economics than you get from the all the bottom up garbage that neoclassical economists have been wanking on about for the last hundred and fifty years. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, Steve, you've, you've said so much, and we could just we could just delve into that. <laughs> but um, and I love the water analogy. And 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 speaking about water, let's. Um, I think we should bring um, Mike Radzicki into the studio and see what he's drinking. Mike, what, he's what, are you, what are you drinking? No hands, hands free. Get that right beer. Here. Get that beer, mate. Come on, get that beer. No, no, see. No, come on, come on, not that one. The he other has to one. redeem it. He has to put. <laughs> Isn't that something? Rads. Tell the story. I'm not Mike. making tell it up. <laughs> come it's on, yeah, tell the brewery. story. Yeah, well, it's just a craft brewery in uh, a town near us, and we were in there one day, and they had one of their brands they called Rads, and I said, "Well, we better take some of that home." <laughs> <laughs> 
What, what, what do, you, do you know the genealogy of them calling it Rads? Is it somebody in it called Radziki? Is it no, Polish? We asked what? the server and, uh, and nobody could tell us why, at least in the folks we were interacting with. So I don't know. It remains an open question. Well, be, we want it answered that? before the next show. Yeah, I, me, I, actually, I do too. I, I got to circle back. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Go do some research. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Fun, yeah, do fun some research. research. <laughs> Is there um is there a mathematical because is it radians right so you're talking about circular um like mathematical calculations is that what rads means in mathematics no no, no. no. oh you no. think radians no. you're radians radians okay. radius yeah yeah okay. or radian by the way uh, Douglas Jules just met, uh, in the chat Douglas Jules has mentioned a very good book by a good friend of mine John King called the Micro Foundation Delusion so I'd highly recommend people checking that out to see why me, I am in particular against working from bottom up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, guys, here's a, here's kind of my plan. So I think we're going to actually get both of you to read the uh, the top chatters here in a second. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I'm well, going to... I'm going to throw it. Uh, 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 after, after the wonderful reading by Jim uh, oh, a yeah. couple of weeks, was it last two weeks ago? I'm going to yeah. throw a curly in there. So I'm going to get the first two, Mike, and you can follow after that, okay? Okay. What would you hey, add? We just make it up as we go. So no, that's that sounds that sounds okay, great. Okay, okay. That sounds great. Okay, so let's um okay. let's pull that up. Let's just jump into it. Let's do the top chatters. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, I'm waiting. Cabin economics, Thomas Sourget. So am I going over here, um, Mike? Yeah, uh, I'm going across back and forth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dave Folks and Web Freaks. Then I pause and. Okay. This is working? Douglas Dual, Community Wealth Candidates. That's a new one. Uh, Chefcock Alfred, Algorithm. Voting for Biden, Joe Polito. 21st Century Poet and Tom Roberts. MC and Rebel County Socialist. Steve Fitt and TR. David Collins and Joe Viganar. Raphael and Stephen Hinton. Blue Bay and Wayne McMillan. Ghost on the Half Shell and Andrew Sullivan. Larry Summers and Owen Wall. Danger Zone and Mano Haran. Phil Waller and David Wilkie. Yeah, 7598 and Petrified Produce. And Apple Scab and Tony Wilson. Bubba Jones and Lana Dell hates the clock. And Bob Leorian taking out the rail, economics in one lesson. There. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, I mean, it was it gets points for novelty for sure. Definitely. Definitely. Not, not not as good as not as good as Jim. Okay. Hey, maybe, maybe Dave, we, Mike, we've got to work on our double act here, okay? Need a bit more pizzazz. Yeah. And... Yeah, he had he had yeah. quite the theatrical voice. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, he was marvelous. Was, yes. He was he just blew it out of the water. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how do we get him back just to do that every week? <laughs> 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 okay. Well, I think that. we I think we can bring Kahal in um, in a minute, but I wanted mm. to maybe set the stage with some anthropology and um, Graber's book on BS. So what what do you guys know about um, Anthropologists and and Graber's book on 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 BS economics. You mean bullshit jobs? Yeah, bullshit jobs. Yeah, yeah. No, David was actually a close friend, and mm -hmm. uh, I have to say that his death in 2020 was more shocking for me than my own mother's death because at least my mother died at the age of 94, and I knew by the time she got to the day, she said numerous times she'd lived too long. You know, she didn't. She wanted to go to sleep and not wake up. Uh, whereas David, the thought of losing David at the age of 59, with all he was contributing and all he could have contributed, and the great soul that he was, that was a huge shock to me. And mm -hmm. uh, I still think about him virtually every day. Um, his book uh, pointed out a wonderful contradiction in capitalism, that we have this argument about it being all about efficiency and, and therefore you wouldn't want to have any bullshit jobs at all. In fact, it's actually very largely about power and status. And, a lot, and there's an enormous... Um, uh, waste in capitalism as well. And it's therefore quite possible to have people who set up hierarchies where they have a large number of underlings reporting to them, largely for the same reason the pharaohs did. 
you know. It has bugger all to do with efficiency, plenty to do about power, and a huge number of people finding themselves working in jobs to which they think is either no social contribution or negative. And that certainly applies to a lot of the finance sector and a lot of the legal stuff that we, uh, you know, we, we need laws. I'm not going to argue against laws by any means, but a huge amount of, of law. Um, is, so I'll give you a little anecdote on that front. Mm. I was forced by my first wife into buying a shit computer because she wanted us to save money. And that shit computer broke down three times in one week, three different machines. And I finally ended up suing to get my money back. And they gave me a free printer with the with the computer that they then wanted to charge me 500 bucks to hang on to. And I said, bugger that I didn't want the bloody printer. I wanted the computer that works. So I went to what's called the Small Trains Tribunal. And because I had a law degree, uh, the, the student who was actually doing the selling brought along a lawyer with him. And uh, it became obvious to me with the hearing that the adjudicator just wanted to reach an agreement. He didn't get who was right and who was wrong. And this, the lawyer came over when we had a meeting outside and the lawyer came over and said, look, well, this is the deal we're going to suggest here. And if you don't agree to it, we're going to hit you with this writ and that writ and you'll never see your money. And I just, I'd, I'd done a law degree and I knew quite a few lawyers. I said, listen, mate, I've done a law degree. I know that the whole purpose of law is to slow down the execution of justice. So shut the fuck up and let's work out a deal here. Now, he basically fell over backwards. He didn't say another word. I had him in personal existential shock because he mm. realized that's what he was doing. He was slowing down the execution of justice. That's the definition of a bullshit job in the legal fraternity. And a huge part of what people find themselves working in in our system is bullshit. And when David made that little blog post, he then got hundreds of people writing back to him saying, yeah, you're right, my job's bullshit. Yeah. So it's an incredible... Um, uh, insight, the sort of thing which David was just a past master at, his capacity to think outside any box whatsoever, including anthropology, was an mm -hmm. enormous contribution. I'm very, very sad that it no longer happens. Yeah, nice, nice uh, mini tribute. I remember, uh, I remember you speaking multiple times about about him, and that's that's nice to hear again. Uh, Mike, what about yeah. your, uh, you know, before before we uh, we bring on the guest, what are what are your thoughts about anthropology and its use and role with um, economics? Do you, do, you, do you bring it into system dynamics or any of uh, any of the curriculum with your students? Well, I'm, I'm certainly not trained as an anthropologist, but the notion that, <clears throat> excuse me, economists should get out from behind their desks and go and find out what's happening rather than they build mathematical edifices um, from their mind behind their desk. And then the real world is they go and <clears throat> download a data set in an Excel spreadsheet or flat file format and torture it with statistics. And that's the real world uh, is seems to me rather odd. I mean, there's there's probably some value here and there to doing that. But how about we get out from behind our desks? And if we're going to build a financial sector, go to a bank, spend some time there and ask people, what do you do? Go to this, uh, uh, your your regional Federal Reserve Bank, attend some seminars there and, and talk to those people and say, what do you do all day? If you want to put in a pricing sector, talk to somebody who does that for a living. They can tell you what they do very precisely, and you can write equations that, that capture that stuff. So to the extent that anthropologists do that and know how to do that, without sort of the social version of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, you know, to observe is to disturb, <laughs> where yeah. the fact that you're there watching them and asking them, they change what they're doing because they're mm. uncomfortable or whatever, you know. So anthropologists have techniques, I believe, that allow them to, as much as humanly possible, observe but not disturb. We should be doing that. And as a yeah. profession, we typically don't do that. And shame mm -hmm. on us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, time to bring the guest in. We're 20 minutes in and it's uh, about time. So let's, uh, before we do that, just finally, I want to I, I want to bring up uh, that we're now on on Steve's LinkedIn page. And, uh, and, you know, so, you know, he needs to grow that channel. So if you can support Steve on his LinkedIn channel, that's great. And uh, let's, let's now bring in Kahal. Hello, everybody. There you go. Welcome in. <laughs> So uh, it what it's it's going great. Um, you've been listening backstage. What have you what have you been thinking about this anthropology talk, uh, BS, and uh, 
and uh, you know, all with the substrate of rethinking economics. What's uh, what, you know, what, what are you thinking there? Yeah, yeah, I was I was a massive fan of of Graeber. Um, you know, not mm. not not just for bullshit jobs, but obviously his his first his first book that really made a splash was Debt, right? Debt, the first five thousand years, yeah. which is obviously something that fits really well with what you do, Steve, right? Uh, because yeah, it was just it about how money doesn't emerge from sort of a fictitious situation where you have a farmer with an apple and another farmer with a banana and they're, they're just trading, right? It's uh, much more complex, the history of money. And uh, I think that was one, because it was released in 2011, right? Uh, so if you're talking about rethinking economics, I think that was that was the year I started my degree in economics. And um, I think I read it before I started the degree, but it was it was something, one of the major books, I could say, that like just completely revolutionized how I thought and told me that basically what we were learning about money was uh, or what we were, what I was about to learn about money was basically nonsense. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> um, I'm going to give you a choice here and it's not usually a typical thing we do with guests, but I'm, I'm thinking, do you, <laughs> do you feel that we should jump right into the behavioral aspects and kind of hit um, uh, Steve's question head on? about you know your work in, in in micro and whether there is a role to play for behavior economics do you think that's uh where yeah you know, where we, yeah we should start i think yeah it's, it's it's an interesting um i mean i was actually just reading um your your latest book uh steve the uh new economics and manifesto um is that the latest one yeah. sometimes i can't keep up with you but <laughs> um <laughs> it's it's the latest published i've actually just finished Literally, yeah. a, la a new one, which hopefully come out later this year. That's the economics, building economics from the top down. From the top so that's, down, that yeah. won't be published. Won't be published. Hopefully, published this year. I'm just not sure how fast the, it'll get edited over here. Yeah, it's pretty slow that whole process. I'm in a similar mm. stage with, mm. with the book I'm writing as well. So it can, I think yeah. it's going to be like a year mm. until it actually gets published. Mm. Mm. So uh, yeah, so tell us about yours. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so. Um, sorry, the book or or my perspective on on the question of of the I'd really your perspective like on the question. That yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah, get yeah, back yeah. to the book afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think behavioral economics. Th there's really lots of different types of behavioral economics. I think, and there's what was sometimes called behaviorist. Um, I think that was in the tradition of people like Herbert Simon, which was supposed to be a more realistic approach to human behavior. Um, but then there's like kind of modern behavioral economics, which is much more mathematical and it's much more of a modification of the the neoclassical approach to have, you know, so you've got like a an individual maximizing utility subject to a budget constraint. You know, they're solving a, a problem, but they're no longer rational in the sense that there's some bias, you know, maybe they uh, they can't predict the future very well. Um, because they're like they're hungry and they're at the supermarket so they buy a load of like cookies and stuff uh, and so there's some kind of bias some mathematical tweak in the um in the function which then translates into a, a result you know buying an amount that maybe isn't rational once they get get down to eating it they realize that they've made a mistake so i think that's a it's a it's it's kind of good that economists realize that people aren't completely rational in the sense that they defined it but i think it, it was a much more watered down version of what people like herbert simon had in mind which i think was a completely different yeah. approach to human behavior um so i mean i, th I think certainly the neoclassical model is wrong whether you want to follow the kind of the biases approach sometimes called the biases and heuristics approach where there are just mistakes and i think one of the things that you get when you you believe that people are making mistakes uh, like being hungry uh, when you go to the supermarket and buying too much is called projection bias, is um, that you just need to correct them, right? You just need to correct those mistakes and then you can sort of, with minimal intervention in terms of policy and government spending or whatever, uh, you, you, you can actually correct people's decisions and then you're back to the land where the consumer is king and uh, you can fix most major problems through things like that, including major problems like like climate change so i mean that was that was the essence of nudge right the the nudge approach which stemmed from this this idea of behavioral economics and i i don't think that that really holds up to scrutiny um any any longer i think if you're going to do behavioral economics you need a much more comprehensive revision of of how you how you model 
and think about human behavior. Um, and I say that I want to make the disclaimer that I do not have the answer to how you do that, but I just uh, think it's something that needs to be done. This, this is where I come in with my criticism of, um, of the behavioral economics in general. And that is that it ended up being you know, like 179 deviations from rationality type stuff. And I, I remember just listening to one presentation and thinking, if I was, I know how a neoclassical economist would react to this. Oh, there's just too many bloody deviations. Let's just assume rationality. So in, in that sense, it tends to be, ends up being part of what uh, Lakatos called the protective belt of a, of a paradigm. Uh, it lets you uh, maintain the core belief of rationality, modified on the outside to deflect criticism, but the core belief in what they call rational behavior continues. Of course, the great flaw in neoclassical rational behavior is that if you told an ordinary person who hadn't done an economics degree uh, what, the defi what, what the definition was of rational behavior, then you would um, have people saying, oh, what word have you defined? Oh, you mean somebody who's prophetic. You mean Nostradamus or Jesus because their definition of rational is has the capacity to predict the future accurately. And that's, you know, in, in that sense, we shouldn't be saying there are deviations that we say, that's crazy. That is not mm -hmm. rational behavior at all. And you've distorted the meaning of the word to hang on to your paradigm. That's fascinating, Steve. That's really fascinating as a, uh, because, you know, way back in, in ancient times where you had prophets and you had, uh, sages, um, that's really interesting, but we have um, modern technology and disciplines and um, like disciplines like economics where we can rely on other tools that describe the way um, these complex systems work. Mike, um, <clears throat> do you think there's hope for uh, a, a synthesis between micro and macro or, or are they are they um, going to develop or should they develop in a vacuum at this point? I guess it depends on what you mean by a synthesis. I think um, the old idea of the micro foundations of macroeconomics kind of comes from an atomistic point of view, methodological individualism, linear thinking, linear models that the behavior of the whole is simply the sum of the behavior of the parts, right? So that's your mm -hmm. supposition property of, of linear systems. So macro just is sort of an afterthought. It just falls out at the end. What you really need to do is, is uh, understand the micro stuff. Um, and that's, of course, what Steve is arguing against, right? Uh, that systems are nonlinear, and you cannot analyze them that way. The sum of the behavior of the whole is more than the sum of the behavior of the parts. You have to look at the interactions and, and what have you. Now, having said that, I personally believe that um, uh, as long as we're doing it, taking a nonlinear approach and looking at the interactions, it's perfectly fine to say, all right, at the micro level at various places in the, in the system, what are people really doing? rather than uh, assuming some kind of rational behavior or uh, providing a very, very simple uh, representation of what they might be doing. Are they anchoring and adjusting? Are they present biased and what have you? And then you can, by the way, you can, <clears throat> when you get that nailed down correctly, in a manner that would be consistent with what's found in laboratory experiments, for example, or in the field by behavioral economists where they would say, yeah, that's what we found. A lot of people do that. They anchor and adjust, let's say. Um, the question becomes, you know, um, so I don't know, Dick Thaler, somebody like that who's advocating, well, you know, um, get to get people to save more for their retirement, have them uh, save more of their raise rather than their present salary. Well, let's try that on the model and let's see with this holistic, all these interactions and feedbacks and so forth, is that really a leverage point? Right, because we've got the we've got the human decision making right, right, at least as far as we know from laboratory experiments, what have you. We're taking a nonlinear approach, right? And but we're looking if we want to change the behavior of the system and make it make the airplane fly better, we got to redesign it, right? Where are our leverage points? It may or may not be a leverage point correcting these these biases. So I think that's where kind of all this all meshes together and where we might have something to say with our simulation tools. 
Mm. And you also got social classes as well, which you know, that's the neoclassic have abolished the thought about social classes. And we, we don't think we have working class these days and middle class and capitalists, but we do. And we need to look yeah. at the social behaviour as, you know, individual behaviour within the social context. And, uh, and, and that's the thing which we've lost courtesy of the neoclassicals. We need to bring it in. And we need to bring Carl in because we're cutting you out of the conversation, mate. So <laughs> It's fun. I don't know. No, I mean, it's, it's interesting you mentioned class because I think one of the useful things that has come out of what you might call mainstream um, uh, behavioral economics is uh, the work of um, Melanathan uh, on, on the effect of poverty on decisions. And mm. it's pretty clear from that that uh, when you have when you don't have very much money, uh, your decision making is quite severely impaired. Um, and so they look at people who have like um, they look at I think one of the one of the most famous studies looked at um, Indian farmers who had very volatile income, and they looked at them kind of uh, just just before they got they got a windfall and and just after, and they found that their sort of decision making was just so much worse just before, just because of the pressure that being in poverty puts on your brain. Um, now that is, I think I think my microphone's peaking a bit. Uh, I think that I think that is something that people maybe you know we've proved it with statistics maybe if economists had spoken to people who'd actually been in poverty they would have learned it a long time ago right because it's uh it's something that anyone who has has had very little money will tell you something along those lines but it's definitely useful knowledge and i think it speaks to this macro versus micro point right because it's one thing to say that you know we we should correct behavior on a micro level with with nudge but it's another thing to ask, OK, well, what are the macro structures that enable people to make uh, good decisions and, and to kind of do their best and, you know, be able to be rational, uh, you know, so to speak. And, and that would that would be something like, do people have enough money? And I think that would be a kind of macro way of correcting that bias. I have a, a colleague or an ex-colleague called uh, Stuart Mills who has been writing about this type of approach to behavioral economics and how you might want to think about the the structures of the macro economy and what kind of behavior they create instead of just looking at individual decisions and how you tweak them to be to be correct can you give us an example yeah. of some of the structures that you're referring to in macro uh that that would be determinants of behavior or influences in behavior can you give me a, a couple of examples um, well, well, I mean, like the income distribution would be one, right? Like, so I think, like, if you're if you're thinking about income distribution, then that would have a direct effect on poverty, uh, in the in the way I was just describing. So, if you have people who, you know, let's say just for the sake of argument, a universal basic income that's a floor under which people cannot fall, um, mm -hmm. then the the effects of poverty uh, are going to be reduced massively or completely eliminated the effects of poverty on decision making right and so that's going to be like i don't know if you, what you could call it like a macro nudge or something mm -hmm. interesting i want to know uh, by my vote in this room um how many of you guys have listened to that davos speech with javier millet the argentinian libertarian i, that, I haven't that got around was, to it yet yeah, that was <laughs> quite interesting uh, uh, life's, Mike's, life's too short life's, life's too, too short, short. <laughs> yeah 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 what about you, you know, Mike? yeah 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 I, I haven't i haven't listened to it either but i love his hairdo you know yeah and his glasses <laughs> the way they sit in there but hey, okay anyways we're, look, we're just um, <laughs> can it can it we're, we're almost almost breaking a thousand viewers today and, and i i just have to say that um it's uh it's looking great and it's a great turnout for steve i want to see as many people as possible um, support the channel, comment. Um, hey, we could send them over to your Patreon page too, right, Steve? <laughs> and and Mike's YouTube <laughs> channel, help. and and you know, let's uh, let's let's support let's support this great initiative. So, anyways, mm. Um, mm. I don't know if that's a viable like response. I guess in terms of me bringing up the Argentinian pre uh, president. But there is a, a, a growing aspect of um, libertarianism in economics and or in, um, in political systems. There's a growing reality of nationalism growing throughout the world. Um, and they would have dramatic effects on, 
on macroeconomics. Would would that not be the case, Steve? Well, they they would because this is what you're not saying. It's not individual behaviour. It's it's crazy theories, and like. If we're going to go from neoclassical to Austrian, we're chasing one chasing crazy theory for another. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm sitting back to watch the Austrian ex experience in in um, uh, Argentina. I mean, one obvious uh, Argentina's massively screwed up economy and has been for a century. So I can understand people going for an extreme solution uh, in that situation. Uh, but you know, let's see what happens next. My feeling is there'll be a huge drop in aggregate demand. Massive poverty, uh, and, and there's so many elements. Like the understanding of money in the in Austrian is even worse than neoclassicals have, and that's that's difficult. But they've managed it. So uh, sh shutting down the central bank, all these sorts of things. You know, I, I want to sit back and see what happens in many ways, uh, rather than commenting. But I'll, I'll I'll force myself to listen to that speech at some stage. But I was going to actually come back to Carl's point earlier. Carl, first of all, how do I print it? Do I pronounce your name Cahal or do I just say Carl? It's Cahal. I never Cahal. know. It's an Irish name. So you say it's in an Irish accent. Cahal. Cahal. Oh, that helps immensely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have had one, two doses of poverty in my life. One very recently from making the mistake of uh, doing a family loan, which I now highly recommend against. Um, but anyway, I realized one thing about that when, when being in poverty. The rich people think the poor don't think about money at all. They're completely wrong. The mm. poor think about money almost all the bloody time. They've got no damn choice. How can I make what I've got stretch as far as I go? Mm. So that's one element where, you know, it, it, it's the opposite of people who are wealthy think, oh, I'm wealthy because I, I know about money, whereas the poor don't think about it. Bullshit. Um, the poor aren't in a position to, to do anything about it, which is half the problem. Um, but the other thing is, have you ever read that book by, um, oh, dear, George Orwell? Um, called Keep the Aspidistra Flying. Have you read it? No, not that one, no. Not that one, no. <laughs> okay. Ha you have, okay, Get, have a read. It's, it's one of his great under-recognised novels, and it's much more a novel than most of the other works. I mean, Brave New... Oh, sorry, 1984 and, um, and Animal Farm and so on are very, in a sense, very stylized. Uh, but Keep the Aspidistra Flying is about a poet who never makes money, is always poor, and then comes up with some idea for a poem, and through the book, the poem gets delivered over time. And part of his point is that uh, he's, he's responding to a newspaper article where somebody criticised the poor by saying, "Look, if I was living on that much money, I could survive. I could, I, I could manage to buy the right things, and I could survive." And his attitude was, "Bullshit." He said, "If you're that poor, you want distractions when the shit world you're in. You're going to go and buy." alcohol you're going to go buy drugs you're going to smoke cigarettes you want something that gives you a bit of pleasure in the misery of being poor and and then he gets wealthy and then he's actually sending up a plant the aspidistra which he, which apparently is a very common plant decorative plant in uh, in england at the time he wrote let's have a read it's it really is a, a well-written uh, fictionalized account of the experience of somebody in being poor and i'm just, Creative says being poor isn't fun. I don't recommend it either. But in that in that situation, um, you 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 have to behave crazily, or you will go crazy. And that's mm. part of the story of keep the aspirators to flying. I actually think I know that passage that you're talking about, even though I haven't read the book. Because okay. he talks about uh, okay. when you're poor, there's always something to tempt you. You know, you, uh, a rich man can happily sit with a breakfast of rivita and orange juice or something. But uh, when you're poor, you can't. I think, is that is that the same passage that you're talking about? Pretty much. It, it, it comes yeah. out of the same idea, yeah. Obviously, so, yeah, the way I know, said it wasn't quite George uh, Orwell-esque, but, you know. No, well, you have to work, <laughs> work on your phrasing a bit there, yeah. <laughs> Look, Carl, let's so, talk a bit about how you and I met and your background, because mm. I think it's very important for people to know mm. where rethinking economics and unlearning economics came from. And, of course, you're in Manchester, and there may mm. be a story about Manchester that you don't know. So hit us with the history. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I called this on my YouTube channel, I called it debunking economics versus unlearning economics. Um, so maybe we can discuss what those two mean. But I, I, um, I actually started to read debunking economics in my first year of university. Now, mm -hmm. I was aware of it. Um, but I think because it was about 500 pages long, I was a bit scared of it for a while. And then I finally decided to take it on. But um, I, I, yeah, it was, um, I decided to, whoops, so during my first year at Manchester, uh, there were a couple of things going on. Firstly, it was 2011, like I mentioned earlier. So 
we were still out of the you know fresh out of the 2008 financial crisis which nobody had really seen coming uh it, it was a massive shock it was uh, uh you know obviously a horrible dreadful thing uh and we just weren't really learning about it in our classrooms and uh we weren't learning about it and to be honest the what we were learning was kind of just a rehash of a level economics so it wasn't particularly relevant or challenging in the first year and so i think that led me to start this blog called unlearning economics right which explains my handle on uh, on on the internet which persists to this day but i i just uh started writing about what i was learning and how how inadequate it was and how unsatisfied i was with the fact that we were just drawing you know islm curves when uh while the eurozone crisis was raging i remember greece literally being on fire and uh we, yes. we just it wasn't even mentioned it wasn't even mentioned in macroeconomics i mean i can't you know it's, it's, it's actually absurd to say it out loud that the class would be so rigid and theoretical and uh responsive to the to the what was going on outside outside the lecture hall but that's the way it was so i was writing this blog and one of the things i actually did which is probably how we kind of met uh steve was that i i did a chapter by chapter write-up of debunking economics as i was writing it as, as i was reading it sorry yeah. on my blog yeah so i did i did this so i went i really kind of went in depth on the on the book and uh yeah got, got to know every chapter very well but it was um it was good because i think you know obviously i i really i really enjoyed the book but also i think sometimes it helped my education as well because i think one thing that economists sometimes miss is that sometimes the best way to learn about something is actually to critique it and think about its limitations right because when you get presented yeah. with all these models in a in a mainstream degree they're just like here it is here it is this is you know this is economics right uh solve it and then you get an answer and that's like and there's no talk no discussion of like the scope of the model what you might call boundary conditions right um, yep. the type of thing you'd have in usually in the physical sciences and th there's just nothing like that and then so you're sort of left thinking okay so so either you're one of those people who just sort of goes along with it you know uh, uh whether through inertia or through actual belief or or you just sort of don't really know where it applies and and where it doesn't um but when, once you start to think about critiques of the models then you realize oh okay so this is uh maybe there are a couple of situations where it could it could apply um i mean i think those are few and far between for the undergraduate models but maybe there are some out there that uh where where they can be used but um and and then there are places where it doesn't apply and this is why and that helps you to understand the assumptions right and what what they mean yeah i mean i um uh i um you know got into well pardon me i've got a i've got a I've got michael hudson calling so pardon me take me out for a second I have a chat to michael hang on quite literally michael so Kyle, <laughs> i i wanted to know can you give a couple of examples of <laughs> of um I guess, well, I mean, you've already given examples of uh, kind of the limited utility of undergraduate models, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're so, like you, you're even speculative to the point to say that it's questionable whether or not, oh, what's this? 256 likes, 2,407 watching. Wow, this is great. This is really wow. good. This is really good, yeah, yeah. Keep up the good work. Maybe it's just because we asked, right? You know, mm. <laughs> we threw it out to the algorithm, and and and, and it was uh, it, it was the right combination of words. Thank you, Google. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I guess I'm looking for a little bit something a little bit more concrete with your work. Mm. I, I I'm looking for something um, uh, something that excites you that I can tease out of your book that you can share with the audience. Uh, or, or your research what what are what are you working on that's exciting and that's that's very novel unique and 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 very you um i mean i mean so let, I'll, I'll tell you about the the book i'm writing so the um the working title i've got for it at the moment is uh why we're getting poorer uh and it's intent intended to be a fairly in in the same manner as my youtube channel is a fairly accessible uh but also hopefully um rigorous um although i don't really like that word because mainstream economists use it too much but you know hopefully a kind of credible and, and evidence driven um and theoretically grounded approach to a lot of the problems that we seem to be facing in our economy you know since uh, well for, for a long time but since the 2008 financial crisis which is 
my adult life. It seems like we had that crisis, you know, and then we had like austerity um, in the UK, especially uh, also elsewhere across Europe, right? The Eurozone crisis. Um, then we had, of course, things <clears throat> like Brexit and things like Trump and things like the rise of the far right across the world um, and coronavirus. And we've had, you know, massive inequality um, and, you know, the fallout of uh, trade deals and globalization and uh, climate change always going on in the background. So, you know, all of these things uh, seem to be coming to a head. And I'm not saying the book addresses every single thing I've just mentioned individually, but what it does do is it tries to take aim at like some of the some of those issues, like some of the inequalities in our economy, um, some of the major markets that I think are failing people. Um, the cost of living crisis is is, is another one, right? Uh, and um, you know things like housing, and just try to explain them from what you could call a heterodox perspective, in the sense that it's not really a mainstream neoclassical perspective, <clears throat> but you know just in in plain language. Um, and in the way, in a way that you know, is hopefully trying to push for some kind of serious, radical solutions to those problems, not just not just uh, you know tweaking around the edges. Would you say it's more of a post-Keynesian approach then? I mean, I would consider myself a, a post-Keynesian slash behaviorist slash institutional economist, which sounds like a lot, except that if you know those schools, you'll know that they all sort of fit together quite nicely. Because I think yeah. one of the major things, yeah, yeah. So one of the major things about post Keynesians, which struck me, which I really liked when I, for instance, read Debunking Economics and you got onto talking about money, uh, same for David Graeber's debt, is when they ask, you know, how, how's money created? How does money work? Uh, then they just say, okay, well, let's, let's go to a bank. Let's go, <laughs> let's go and look at a bank. Let's go and look at the balance sheets of banks. Let's mm. learn how to do accounting, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, I mean, it, it's, it sort of infuriates me when I think that there are people who would actively choose not to do that, even though they had the option. Um, and they're also like arguably in the mainstream of the discipline, right? But it's like, that just seems like such an obvious approach, but that's also the institutional approach is to look at history and the institutions, obviously. And, and so that's why I think it meshes quite well with post Keynesian economics. Um, and so that's, my, the book is in a way very historical, right? Uh, that's, that's the type of approach I like to take. Mike, that's, that's like Mike, 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 Mike could come in just after that. But that mm. point is about observing and seeing how things work and then building a systemic analysis of it. That system dynamics orientation. And people, I've, I remember saying quite a few times with people saying to me during the financial crisis, look, don't economists study the Great Depression? Don't they know what caused it? And I said, no, and no. They do not do the historical work. They don't do the field research. In fact, they disparage both of them. And I've been in economic departments which have voted to shut down his economic history and shut down history of economic thought. So it's actually not based on observation at all. It's armchair logic. Mike. So, so I thought I'd <clears throat> excuse me, uh, weigh in and, and talk about a game we play in system dynamics that kind of ties into a lot of what's being discussed here, including the, the notion of sort of a Cahal's idea of sort of a macroeconomic nudge and some of the things I talked about prior about the redesigning the airplane. It's a well-known game. Anybody can get a hold of it and play it if they want. It's called the beer game. And uh, this is often the first thing that we do in system dynamics is we introduce people to the beer game. And what is it? Well, there's a it's a it's a board game traditionally. There are electronic versions, but the best way to play it, it's a board game. And uh, there are four stations at on the game board. You, you roll it out on a big a conference table. There's a retailer, a wholesaler, a distributor, and a factory. It's a supply chain. And uh, <clears throat> the, the product is beer. Beer is, uh, cases of beer are pennies or bingo chips. And everybody starts with 12 in their inventory. The retailer, the wholesaler, distributor, and the factory. And uh, you're, the only thing you have to do in each round of the game is decide how much beer you want to order from your supplier. Your supplier is the person who sits to your right. So the retailer orders from the wholesaler, the wholesaler from the distributor, the distributor from the brewery or the factory. The factory doesn't order from anybody. They make it. OK, so all you have to do. How much do I want to order from my supplier? OK, everybody who plays the game absolutely everybody generates the exact same behavior. You get a, a giant um, rundown in your inventory of beer, and then a giant overreaction, and then it eventually settles down. You get a big oscillation, and the oscillation gets bigger and bigger and bigger 
as you move up the supply chain towards the factories. It's called a bullwhip effect in, in supply chain management. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what's so interesting about this relative to our conversation? Well, the first thing is after you play the game, oh, the retailer gets their orders, by the way, from a deck of cards from the, the game facilitator. <laughs> so you ask okay. the uh, wholesale distributor of the factory, what do you think the order pattern was on those cards? Because people were ordering 200 cases of beer from their supplier, whatever. And uh, they'll draw what happened to them, a, a big oscillation. That, In other words, the deck of cards caused the oscillation. Okay, and mm. then you show them. The orders were four, 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 and then eight, 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 a straight line. And people were ordering 200, 400 cases of beer, you know, wholly overreaction, Batman. Okay. So then is that why is it? You're blaming the deck of cards. You're blaming external factors. You're not looking to the design of the system. Everybody plays it the same way, whether you're a CEO, a famous professor, or a high school kid, because the system is designed to oscillate. Now, within the structure of a system that oscillates, some people really oscillate and others did, but not so bad. So why is that? And so John Sturman, a colleague of mine at MIT, did a study. People were recording their decisions, okay? And he built a little model that fit everybody's data really well. He had he had like 50, 70 different people who's in the same model was fit to the, the different data sets representing their decisions to order beer and it fit very well. And John said, well, if you're playing this game, what are you doing? You have to look at what are what orders are you receiving from the person to your left or the deck of cards if you're the retailer? Uh, how much inventory do you have? How many pennies do you have? And how many would you like to have? <clears throat> excuse me. And then what have you already ordered, but it isn't here yet because it's, you got to, it, the orders have to go upstream and then the beer comes downstream. There's a big delay. And the cognitive biases where, where a behavioral economist could come in is there were, there were uh, two main factors that were causing this giant overreaction. One was the main was people forgot the supply line. They had already ordered beer, but it wasn't here yet. And they ordered, ordered some more. And it's, it's, it's as though they had gone to a restaurant and ordered a drinks and a meal. And the waiter came back with the drinks and you look down and you don't see your steak yet and you order the meal again. <laughs> no mm. one would do that because they remember I've already ordered the meal. There's just a delay before the chef prepares it. But people were reordering the beer because it hadn't come yet. <laughs> and then the other one was... Yeah. People would need to jump in orders from the deck of cards or from their uh, from their customer downstream, and they would overreact like, "Oh my gosh!" And they, you know, so so you had a bunch of so then you get into okay, how could you um, at your position in the game, given it's going to oscillate anyway, what could you do? Well, you need information about the supply line to remember that or what have you, and then at the macro level, the macro nudges. What can we do to redesign this overall airplane that's going to oscillate anyway? Even if you play well and you, you sort of tap down the cognitive biases, the overreactions and forgetting and whatever, it's still going to oscillate, but not as bad. But can we do something to fix that? Can we redesign how the system's structured, reduce the delays, change the information flows and what have you? So it's quite an insightful game. It's one of these things where people say years later, yeah, I took your course. I don't remember any of that programming stuff or whatever, but I remember playing that damn beer game. <laughs> Kahal, well, that shows uh, the structural and sorry, that yeah. shows the structural and systemic nature of a capitalist system, and that's what system dynamics is much better at than behavioral, because behavioral focus has focus. Kahal can talk about ways that it might be changing, but it mm. focused on how an individual's behavior is rational or irrational given a set of, you know, costs and, and mm. utilities, whereas the real thing, it's a system of, uh, of, of processes and the interaction of systems gets in the way. So my favorite example of that was actually an academic paper I did with a, a friend in, in Perth, Max Kumaro. Max was an expert on commercial real estate. And what he found was that the commercial real estate would over, uh, booms and busts were common, of course, in commercial real estate. And I did a mathematical model of the process that he had. And what I found was the way to stop the oscillations and to get the supply of commercial uh, 
real estate to match the demand much more closely was to increase the bureaucratic delays in approving projects, <laughs> which was counterintuitive. If you sped mm. it up, you got more instability. Oh, my. I don't like that. Mm. Steve, I don't like that at all. <laughs> I, I, I want to <laughs> offer a criticism, Mike, though, because I was following you on that beer game. Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't know if the analogy of of the waiter analogy is the right analogy. Right. I mean, you didn't get your steak. So you ordered another steak. But I'm an order taker. I was in supply chain and I was a category manager for a billion dollar um, company. Well, I mean, operating company called Cisco in the United States. They're all over the United States okay. and North America's yeah. biggest. Yeah. So we would have inventory replenishment systems. And so this is exactly coming out from behind the desk. And so it, they were not they were not complicated calculations, but you needed to take into account only a few things: the delivery lead time. You needed to know perishability. You needed to know several several things. Yeah. Now, if you're a restaurant tour, which just by definition, if you're talking about beer, you're talking about uh, like an, a fine establishment uh, uh, of, of of an opening in. Uh, in, in, in a restaurant of sorts, right? And so the staff or whoever's ordering it is going to order more based on the number of people that are walking through the door. So they're not consuming it, they're selling it. So that's not a good analogy with the steak because you, yeah, you can only eat one steak. But if I consistently get more and more people coming in, yeah, but, and if it's but, an isolated beer, if it's a brand new beer and a beer launch on a major uh, pub or something like that. And you're like, well, we've got this new beer called Kahal beer, right? Okay. It's just come in and it's a stout beer that replaces Guinness. And you can't believe how many people are ordering this. They're just coming in in droves and droves and droves, just like the people watching this YouTube channel. They're coming in, they're coming in, they're coming in, they're coming in. So what do you think the buyer's going to do? The buyer's going to keep ordering more so that the stock replenishes and their baseline of their stock was actually floats up. Now, this is a complex decision because there's the restaurateur who's outlaying the capital. There's the person that's working who's balancing this. And they're saying, well, we do run the risk that next week, Cajal gets hit by a bus. And then what happens if all these people go back to Guinness and I'm stuck with all this beer? It's There's so many factors in this that it, it to me, it reeks. It reeks of not beer. It reeks of like an incomplete thesis, an incomplete hypothesis, guess at what's actually going on. I, I, so the, I, the, the over, you're more describing the overreaction bias. The, the, the uh, waiter uh, reordering the steak uh, example is the other bias, the forgetting the supply line, which you've already ordered. Um, and, and, I, yeah, and I get, yeah, it's tricky business when you have a, a sudden jump because of, you know, The Rock endorses or Kim Kardashian endorses something or, or whatever, and suddenly everybody wants it. Right. But Taylor Swift endorses it. So everybody suddenly wants it. So that's a different thing. But the other thing you would see, the other kind of sort of funny example of order, forgetting that you've already ordered something and reordering it as elevators. You press the button to order the elevator car and there's a delay. It's not here yet. What does everybody do? They go up and press the button again. Yeah, so but I mean, it's, it's, Mike, like, it's already <laughs> ordered. It's coming. I know, but it, it reeks of of like oversimplification of somebody that is actually a rational human being. And, and so what that they push that button? We're not talking about somebody that's spending company money. And I think we're focusing on the on the on the wrong bias. The actual reality is that there's responsible people in place that are actually making calculated and informed decisions. And so there's high degree of rationality in there. But at the same time, this is how systems are mixed responsible part. They're respond not saying anybody's purposely doing something wrong, but human nature being what it is, uh, and not by the way, not everybody who plays the game really overreacts. Uh, some some do a lot, and others are more, much more um, cautious or whatever. And then you get into you know you're playing this game in real time. You, people don't have calculators; they're not running you know um, uh, a time series analysis to try and forecast. Or you, for today, you'd use AI to forecast. So, but that comes after the game. It, the game is intended to stimulate thinking, right? It's not intended mm -hmm. to be truth or something. And you say, well, how would we redesign the system? And you might say, hey, this is tough. When there's a jump in orders, it's intended to shock the system like the airplane's flying along and a burst of wind hits it, right? Now there's a shock. How are you going to deal with the shock? Well, if we had better tools to better predict um, order streams, 
and is this a one one off kind of thing or, or a fad or whatever, uh, then we would, you know, the system would behave better. Right. So so I, I guess so I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you that that responsible people trying hard uh, are, you know, sometimes have to deal with these very complicated, you know, is this a fad or is Kahal going to get not show up next week? Or we, his beer, he takes his name away from. I, I, I would say that stock markets we, are much more of a path dependent system. Right. Stock markets are as opposed to what, what you're talking about. Anyway, Steve wants to come in and say something. And then we yeah, look, I'm going to I want to I want to I want to finish about get back to Carl. I want to actually get to talk about econocracy, Carl, because that's a book oh. which I think is very important. It's been forgotten to some extent. But back to just before I do that, uh, the way the way that system dynamics came about was because of these sorts of fluctuations inside a factory. Forrester was approached by a factory that couldn't understand why it had such severe cycles in its output. And they were thinking it was because of the external orders. And then he went in and looked at all the time lags that existed between various stages of a product being uh, invented, uh, designed, made, produced, man uh, shipped, and then, and then marketed. And he said, it's your internal structures that are causing that fluctuation, not the external environment. So system dynamics actually grew out of a situation very much like what the beer game is trying to simulate. But Carl, tell us about econocracy, because that was a, your first um, major writing, I think, with three colleagues. And I have to say, mm -hmm. of all the books I've read, which are written by more than two authors, that's probably one of the best written ever. I wouldn't, if I hadn't been told there were three authors, I would have thought there were one. So I want you to explain how you did such a brilliant job of bringing together different voices so well. Yeah, that, thanks very Tell much. I really the, enjoyed. The, the, I, I really enjoyed the. Hey, there we go. I really enjoyed the supply yeah. chain debate there. Um. So, so uh, yeah, it, it was. So we started writing it. So I um. We in Manchester we started this society, and it was called the Post Crash Economic Society. And we, we started it precisely because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, which was that we didn't really have uh, a, a very relevant or, or interesting education. It was all very abstract and theoretical. So post-crash economics, right? Like we, we are post the financial crash. Why aren't we seeing it on the, on the syllabus? And uh, it's a pretty simple question. But that uh, eventually, uh, and the post-crash economic society still exists today, by the way, it's, it's managed. It's had some very good staying power for a student organization. Yeah, um, it has. It's been around for over over a decade now. And um, it also turned into Rethinking Economics, which is now a registered charity. And there are groups like Post Crash Economics all over the world. Um, now, now there are groups, you know, in, in, in Uganda and Guatemala, as well as in, uh, you know, the UK, Europe and the States. Um, and there are groups in Vietnam as well and, uh, and, and Japan. So it's really it's really a great movement. But it, it uh, we got offered the opportunity to do this book because what we actually did was we did a curriculum review at Manchester. So we went through some of the major core modules and we evaluated them based on basic pedagogical criteria. Did they uh, enable critical thinking? Was there, uh, you know, empirical stuff, uh, historical stuff? Basically, did the real world have a place? And we found that they did really badly, most of the core modules. And then yeah. we got offered to expand that into a book which looked at curricula not just at manchester but across the um across the country so it's all, it's all based in the uk but we did this very um intensive audit i suppose you could call it of the courses at seven russell group universities um don't remember which ones they were now but uh, i think manchester lse cambridge exeter sheffield i can't remember um and a couple of others but we, we managed to get hold of all the course materials, all the past exams, because we had so many student groups, because obviously the universities weren't going to give it, give them to us. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we had all that and we evaluated them again a little bit more methodically uh, based on those criteria. And again, just found that, you know, uh, as, as we summarized it, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that you can go through an economics degree without once being asked to venture an opinion. Um, you know, you just don't take a question like the Great Depression. What caused the Great Depression? There's room for reasonable disagreement about that, right? You know, you can you can think about uh, the exact causes, um, how different policies played into it, what got us out of the Great Depression. Was it more fiscal? Was it more monetary? I think there's room for reasonable disagreement uh, for that, but you would never get asked a question like that. So that was the curriculum review, and that was kind of how it happened. Now, what then happened was we were like, okay, 
why does why should anyone care about this right this is like a you know a curriculum review of the degrees at a bunch of universities in the uk the people like is this just going to be like a paper uh for a few academics to read uh you know if you did a curriculum review of i don't know archaeology uh would people be interested in it and we realized that obviously the the which is now obvious in hindsight, the reason that this is so important is because economics affects everyone, because economics is so yeah. widely used uh, in the world. It's, it's the language of policy debates. Economists are employed extensively by governments as well as the private sector. And it's, you, you know, it, economists appear on the, on the news all the time. There's all, we're always focused on things like GDP, inflation, unemployment, economic quantities. You need to understand this to really be a participant in political debate it seems. So uh, we, we decided to call the kind of society where economics played such a prominent role in politics and econocracy, right? Uh, like, a, you know, like a democracy. Like a econocracy. theocracy. Yeah. No, a theocracy. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people find the word econocracy hard to say. Um, but we decided... Because how does your first name? Theme. Well, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Say it with it's, an uh, Irish accent. Say it with it. Say, yeah. <laughs> econocracy. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> economocracy. I should, yeah. Scottish accent. I should have picked it up. But yeah, mid, right. mid, uh, mid country. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that that was just that was just the book, and that was like how we kind of motivated it, and then tried to broaden it to to tell people why should you care about the curricula mm. uh, at Russell Group universities in the UK. But it turns out you should because when a bunch of people go into these important positions with an education that's completely inadequate, then they they're going to make some pretty uh, lackluster decisions and that's been so. the history of england ever since yes mike <laughs> well, I, i'd like to toss a question to kahal um it, it's in the behavioral economics realm uh it seems to me that of all the various cognitive biases and what have you that people uh employ when they make their actual decisions in economics i believe the most important one is the formation of expectations and in, in heterodox economics and post-Keynesian economics, as everybody knows, we, we deal with uncertainty and non-ergodic systems rather than ergodic risk in systems. But mm. so many economic decisions are made based on expectations. Rational expectations are ridiculous, in my opinion. Adaptive expectations doesn't get us that much farther down the road. I've done some behavioral expectation modeling with uh, anchoring and adjustment. But if you read Keynes's chapter 12 on, on, on his beauty contests, mm. like, wow, it can <laughs> expectations in an uncertain world are really hard to to model and capture. And yet I think they're so important. So what is your view on expectation formation and its its modeling and its role in uh, in economics? Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's it's, it's mm -hmm. so important. I mean, I. Um, it goes back to the, this this rational expectations, and this this was like one of the things that we were learning, right? These models with completely rational expectations, and like Steve said earlier, rational means clairvoyant. It means able to predict the future. It means you know all of the future possible states of the economy and adjust your behavior accordingly based on those probability distributions that's not rational it's, it's just it's just a completely counterfactual idea of, of it's prophetic yeah. but it is just like it's completely ridiculous right there's absolutely no way anybody can um can know can can know anything even approximating that about the economy um so i mean my i mean my view of expectations i'd, I'd love to i'd love to sit here and tell you that i have a, a really well uh, formulated mm. view of how people uh, create their expectations. I can only really tell you that I, I definitely don't think that they're rational. Um, but I think I think one of the things about like fundamental uncertainty and Keynes beauty contest. So just in case anybody listening doesn't know what that is, I might just explain. So it's, he said the uh, a beauty contest where your uh, people are basically not just guessing the answer to how uh, not just putting forward the answer, sorry, to rating how beautiful someone is in a newspaper, right? What they're actually doing is they're trying to guess what other people's answers are. But then what you get is actually it's not that you're just guessing what everyone else's answer is. It's that you're trying to guess what everyone guesses the answer of everyone else is going to be. Right. So you reach like a kind of third degree. Right. Of like uh, uh -huh. not just like what do I think and not just what do other people think, 
but what is everyone going to think, right? Uh, and knowing that everybody else is thinking this. So yeah, this this is the beauty contest, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And my, my inclination with this is all, and it goes back to what we were discussing right at the beginning with the behaviorist stuff, is just that when it's given the, this fundamental uncertainty, right, and and complexity, and the fact that we really, really don't know what's going to happen in the future, even even with probabilities, um, I do think that's where you get people just people just falling back on like much more simple rules, right? People use really simple rules, and the psychologist Gerd Gigerenza is really good on this, right? He's um, kind of toes the line between that irrational rational divide that we we were discussing earlier, where he's like, you know people will people will just take a very obvious cue um a very obvious cue in 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 their in their environment right or they'll they'll like for instance the most obvious one is just copying what the person next to you is doing uh because that's good enough that's literally you know mm -hmm. what you go into you go into a room and everybody's silent uh you probably think oh god okay everyone's probably everyone's silent for a reason maybe i shouldn't you know play the trumpet or something right so and it's just uh i think that's that's why we just yeah oh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks for bringing it down the tone steve um but yeah like uh literally uh, so <laughs> um but yeah we we um we just we just fall back on these fairly simple rules and giga Renza's works really good right on like what kind of rules are are best for us to use what kind of simple rules and not just like optimizing mathematics, what kind of simple rules can make predictions and things like that. So, um, I mean, that would be my answer. I hope it answers your question. Uh, yeah, well, it's, just, it's a I've, sticky I've, wicket, right? It's go ahead, well, hold Steve. on a second, guys. We're but, about but the, 10 minutes. Hold on, Steve, just a sec. We're going to actually get Gahal to, to in his, <laughs> in his um, most oh, egregious okay. Irish accent. We're going to get, we like to ham things up here. <laughs> okay. So in your most egregious, um, flamboyant Irish accent, I'm going to bring up the top chatters and and oh, this is your chance to let loose. Go ahead and 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 read all the top chatters. All, all, all of them. All of them. <laughs> all of yeah. That, all of them. Cabin, special accent. Yep. Cabin mm -hmm. economics. Thomas Serdish. Dave Folks. Web freaks. Community wealth candidates. Douglas Dow. JD. Chef Cock Alfred, Algorithm, Voting for Biden, Joe Polito, 21st Century Poet, Tom Roberts, Rebel County Socialist, MC, Steve Fitt, TR, T Orr, I should say, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dave Collins, Jovian Orr, Raffle, Stephen Hinton, Wayne McMillan, Blue Bye. <laughs> That's got Australian there. <laughs> it was. This is getting harder and harder. This is getting harder and harder. Mm. Ghost on the half shell. Andrew Sullivan. Larry Summers. Good one. Owen Wall. Danger Zone. Man Oren. David Wilkie. Phil Waller. Yeah, 7598. Petrified Produce. Tony Wilson. Apple Scab. Baba Jones. Lanadel Hates the Clock. Economics in one lesson, Bob Leori. Wow, that's that's that really good. You know, Kahal, you. I like the accent there. It was the accent was great, <laughs> but you know what? I have to point out that was entirely an example of that confirmation bias because you had just watched the norm of going <clears throat> Mike Rizicki, Steve Keen. It has never happened on that show except for what you witnessed first, and you participated in that sort of left to right. There we yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, that's Determined. true. I literally read it exactly the same way. <laughs> Why? Because so, you actually, didn't... I'm going to. I wanted. I didn't dive in with on the expectations because I was going yeah. to bring up a couple of quotes here to give you an idea of what it's like. Because people talk about rational expectations, but have you ever read the original paper that gave us rational expectations, John Muth's paper? Muth, Muth, yeah. Okay. Here, here, is, here is Muth. The hypothesis asserts three things. One, information is scarce and the economic system generally does not waste it. You mm. can stop right there because if you say something is scarce according to neoclassical theory, it has a price. And if it has a price, you don't buy an infinite amount of it. You buy it up to the point at which the marginal, marginal utility of more information equals the marginal cost of acquiring it. So therefore, according to neoclassical theory, it's rational to be irrational. 
Now, is that what they did? Bullshit. They simply assumed information is scarce and free. Now, you find me a planet on which that applies, and you might find neoclassical economics working. And if you want to go to somebody we all like rather than the nonsense of neoclassical, uh, the word that you have, just, just to check and see what you guys know of Minsky, what's the word Minsky uses before the word expectations? Yeah. Hey, I have one here. Is it unstable? No, I should have. Oh. I, I should have put a bet down here. Euphoric. Oh, okay. oh euphoric. So what he yeah, talks right. about is expectations. Expectations changing through a cycle. So he said, if you start in a, in a slump, everybody thinks the slump is going to continue. So what then happens is people are very conservative in what they put forward as as policy as. as investment proposals. You'll only put forward for a bank for funding or for equity finance, really conservatively estimated projects. Now, because they're conservatively estimated, most of them succeed. And then what happens is people say, oh, we were too conservative. If we'd put more, had more leverage, we would have made more money out of that game. So expectations well, yeah. shift from being depressed to euphoric and cycle and so on and so forth. So what you've got in Minsky is a realistic understanding of expectations formation. He's really taken Keynes's idea and made it into a systemic uh, uh, attitude as to how expectations shift over time. So that's, and this is the, Carl, you talked about the gap between what economists do and what people think economists do. And mm -hmm. people like Minsky actually do what people think economists do. They go and ask banks how do they operate. They go and talk to people in, in boardrooms and work out how their behaviour shifts. So the realistic stuff comes out of the post-Keynesians, generally speaking, because they're the ones who go and ask the questions. Yeah. Yeah. So if I can, uh, that, was, that was actually quite good, Steve. Um, that was great. Let me pose oh, one other thank you. question that I had here. Well, <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm sincere, believe it or not. Let it is due when it's due. I, right? have, I have one other what I've, I got an I've been saying got an advantage. I'm here at beer time, but I haven't had, had any beer, but I'm trying to behave like I've had a beer. There okay. you go. Yep. So uh, you. I want to put another one on on uh, Cahal's plate, uh, just because he's a, more of an expert than I am on uh, behavioral economics. But mm -hmm. another one that I think is very important, another bias or aspect of human decision making that's important for economics is risk assessment. And I, I was first motivated to think about, begin thinking about this by one of my colleagues who's a psychologist. And uh, he did his original work uh, in the state of Colorado, which if you're familiar, has lots of mountains and so forth. And because of the terrain, homeowners have a problem with radon gas in their basements. So it's a poisonous gas. And if it's just, it's, it's, you don't detect it, uh, by odor or anything like that. And you can be breathing it and get lung problems and what have you. So the state wow. of Colorado as a, um, as a policy uh, offered free radon testing kits to any citizen who wanted it. And you basically you open it up and leave it out for, I don't know, a week or something. And it absorbs radon gas if there is any. Then you put it in a, a, a stamped self-addressed envelope kind of thing and you send it into the uh, a lab and for free they'll test it and tell you if you have a radon gas problem in your basement or your your cellar well you would think darn near every homeowner would get one of those because it's a problem and it's free but only a small fraction of the population of homeowners bothered to get the free kit of the people who bothered to get the kit only a fraction put the, the sensor thing out Mm -hmm. Of the people who got the kit, put the sensor thing out, only a smaller fraction sent it in for testing. And of the people who did all of that and the people who had radon, nobody did anything about it to vent it. Mm -hmm. So you're like, what's going on here, right? It, this is like an important problem, but people obviously it's with smoking or their seatbelts, they're assessing the risk and they're making some sort of, of judgment that seems irrational yet people do it. So I'm wondering if what your uh, your thoughts on uh, that sort of bias, or if you think there's something for economics that people are doing that's more important than, let's say, that one. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my behavioral economist answer, which is quite individualistic, but I do think it holds some water in this case, is one thing's for sure. I don't, now, I don't, as I implied earlier, I don't like doing behavioral economics in the way that's like, you know, everyone's irrational and we need to correct their behavior. But one thing is for sure, we are absolutely terrible with probabilities. We, we really are bad as humans with probabilities. And you can, there's loads of people, uh, you know, Giga Renza, for instance, really disagrees with Kahneman and Tversky. 
about the prevalence of biases, how biased people are, how wrong they are. But he agrees we are really bad. And you can give questions to doctors about the efficacy of a vaccine and you can give them like the efficacy of a vaccine, the number of people in the population, the number of false positives, the number of false negatives, and then say, you know, so how many people are going to have a false positive? Um, and, and they'll just get the answer wrong, like quite, quite consistently. So it, it, it does seem to be persistent for everybody um, and low probability events, especially. So I think, I mean, the, the, or, well, there's one thing. The first thing is, is it a low probability event? Um, but I think it's clear that people are thinking of it as one, right? Like they're like, they, we, we do have this tendency to be like, it's not going to happen to me. Uh, we don't really, yeah. Or, or this, this really low probability, probability event is basically as good as, as no probability. Uh, so behaviorally, that's probably what's going on there. The other question I would ask, and this is something that like I've, I've, I've written about, um, more in the context of climate change, but I actually just repeat, released a paper about the limitations of like green nudges um in 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 affecting uh pro environmental behavior but how, i mean how easy actually was that process to get one because literally every step you put on you know uh between the person uh deciding they're going to do it and actually be doing it and you know reporting the results and changing something that literally every step every transaction cost that you put between them and, and actually completing it is going to take out like you know <laughs> another 20 percent of the population right. but you said you the way you described it it was stages right and the more stages the, there's just no way yeah. people yeah. are going to yeah. do it it's just inertia really right but i wonder if it was just too tricky a process to be honest yeah, that, that could be it. But it, it's a it's a curious thing. And, and again, the, the whole risk assessment goes more broadly than that particular example. Right. Yeah. That people they you know, with like with wearing a seatbelt or smoking or, or whatever. There's the, the classic examples that they they just have some. The, the evidence is quite clear, like it's a good idea to wear a seatbelt. Right. <laughs> and some people just don't. Yeah. Do it. When I when I first yeah. uh, drove in America, it was way back in the late 90s. Um, the car I hired had an automatic seatbelt. It was actually you hop in the car, turn and turn the engine on, and the seatbelt drags across your body. And the thing it was it was so difficult to get Americans to voluntarily have their freedom constrained by having to put on a seatbelt that they built it into the car, which I thought that it might be the only way to work around it. Now, I think apparently Americans do wear them voluntarily these days, but that certainly wasn't the case in in '96. On the radon, rad, radon gas is an off is, is a radioactive product of radium, is it not? Hmm. I think it's radioactive. Yeah, it's due to the geological. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and I can't help saying, I'm sorry, is this where Rocky Mountain High comes from? Yeah. <laughs> I feel John like I'm Denver. beyond my <laughs> reference, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I, would, I heard this concept from uh, um, Brett Weinstein and on his show, uh, Dark The Dark Horse podcast with Heather Hang. And he's yeah. identified that a... a um, small changes are what's needed to drive behavior. And this is where ideological framings are so dramatic in their change. Then um, it, I think it comes back to what, what Mike's saying about path dependency. Um, and I think it comes back to what everybody's saying about discounting risk, especially with the time bias moving into the future. Right. I mean, and the, 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 I guess the most prevalent example is, you know, safe for retirement. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, when I get there one day, well, boom, all the people who are in the upper age brackets are going to say, it comes at you really, really fast. And then back to what Steve was saying several, several shows ago is that even with your head in system dynamics and your expertise as a, as a, as a world leading economist, post Keynesian economist, you still admittedly do not intuitively understand um, exponential behavior. You have to look at the program yeah, in do. order to derive, holy shit, this is what's happening. And that's one of the great weaknesses of trying to bring it all down to the individual level as well, because it presumes the individual have the capabilities to do the analysis at the systemic level. But one of the classic statements, as you'd know, is that one about the hum humanity's great failing is the inability to understand the exponential function. And we just don't think that way. We think in a very linear way. 
and yet the world is, was exponential. So um, the classic is, and this, this is work by Tom Murphy, who's somebody I want to have on the program at some stage as well, the physicist Tom Murphy, who, of course, by training, has to understand exponential functions. And he makes the point that completely leaving aside global warming, completely leaving it out of the question, simply the, the second law of thermodynamics and the energy that we're, we're using in our production processes on this planet, that energy has been growing since 1650 at 2.9% per annum. They said, what about if it grows at 2.3%, which of course is therefore less than the historical average, a 2.3% annual rate of growth of something means it increases by a factor of 10 every century. He says, you go, so one century is 10 times, two is 100, three is 1,000, and four is 10,000. And at that basis, if we continued growing our energy consumption at 2.3% per annum, the waste heat generated by the sheer thermodynamical principle, second law, in 417 years would raise the temperature of the globe to 100 degrees Celsius. So um, Now that gets I, in your I, head. I, Forget about continued growth on a finite planet. Yes, mate. The, the way I the way I, I teach the kids about ex exponential growth to get them going is I take a piece of paper and I fold it in half. Oh, yeah. The thick the thickness is twice it's twice as thick. I fold it in half again. It's twice as thick again and so forth. You keep folding it, right? It's gr the thickness is growing exponentially. And I ran the I have the simulation. I say if I fold it a total of 42 times. Now, at some point, you can't really do that. But if I was able to fold it 42 times, how thick is the paper? And you ask the kids and they'll say a foot, a yard, a meter. Somebody will say a mile and the whole class will laugh. What's the answer? It's around 250,000 miles thick if you fold it in yeah. 42 times. I only folded it like four times here. You reach, you reach the, the moon. Power of exponential you reach the growth. moon. Yeah. Yeah. To reach, yeah. That's why I did it, to reach and, the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the failing that we just cannot think in that sense. And, you know, you, you didn't need to know that to throw a spear at the, at the local um, mammoth running past. It's, uh, it, it's, it isn't part of what we have to understand, but it's the world we have created. And our biggest failings are the inability to realise that this is the, the social system we've created with its emphasis upon growth is living in an exponential world, not a linear one. And therefore, we simply cannot continue doing this stuff in the way that all economists blase assume that you can. And right, even guys, if you look I, at Mike, I, I want, I'm going to pause because I'm going to give you a challenge, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. If we can get if we can get some more likes, because we're right at a threshold here of likes. If we can get some more yeah. likes to 700, okay, we can get 700 likes next week. Mike's going to wear a hat. Did you accept watch the next week, what? a hat? Oh, a hat. a hat. Yeah, I'll wear a hat for 700 likes, sure. Yeah, okay. All right. Any particular kind of hat? <laughs> well, okay, we like to ham it up on the show, right? So, I mean, the funkier, the better. Oh, all right. Well, okay, I'll have to think about I probably have some weird hat. Okay, I'll think about that. All right, okay. Well, we got to watch those li that like button. And come on, guys. Yeah, come yeah. on, guys. Hey, we, we, we actually, we actually want exponential uh, performance on the on the viewership here, Carl. I yeah, want to go back to when you and I actually viewers, physically yeah. met. Yeah, I want to go back to when you and I physically met, which was in Manchester in two thousand and fourteen. Do you remember? Was it at your uh, debate in Manchester? Was that the first time we physically yes, met? Yes, that's right. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, have a bit of a chat about that because that that'll give people a flavour of what it's like to be trolled by a mainstream economist. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh full disclosure peter who you debated is also uh, a friend of mine <laughs> and i've actually spoken to he's him a good bloke day. he's a, yeah. he's a good bloke oh. i mean i'm not going to knock him as a human being he's a nice guy i agree <laughs> i made a video of that and i was surprised about how vicious uh a disagreement could get did you did you did you think you ain't seen vicious? nothing compared to what i've been through so wow. you, 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 people are Economics has very vicious debates, and I've been in quite a few, as you can imagine, over my time. The bloke that they got from the department to, to, to debate me was actually a very nice guy, but he wasn't really an economist, was he? He's, he's sort of, um, what was his actual Well, he, I don't think any background? of the, ma the macro economists really... No, none of the macros get, came yeah, in, no, they, no they micro. Wouldn't, and, they wouldn't do it. So it was it was only because Peter's like a, a micro economist, which these days... And I, nice mean, guy, I fit, so this, yeah. I fit mm. this category as well, really. Like these days, it kind of means like a 
a statistician almost, right? You're like a, you do mostly econometrics, right. yeah. you do mostly applied data. And it could be, you could be looking at the effect of, you know, uh, Victorian, uh, uh, you know, chimney um, types on, on the uh, lung disease in the local area, right? Which isn't strictly really economic, yeah. but that's just the type of thing that people look at. So it's not necessarily uh, directly related to economics and certainly not to the questions like, you know, financial crises, uh, business cycles, money, debt, whatever. Right. So, yeah. so yeah, it was like, um, but I, I, yeah, that was, I, I didn't know that was the first time I met you in person, but yeah, you, you came up and then we had this, uh, big debate in a, in a big, in a pretty big theater. It was very, it was very full, I think. Um, and it was, uh, was it can economists predict financial crises? I think that was the title. Something like um, that. But that, that, that's yeah. why the bloke who they had, we could really, well, he wasn't in a position really to debate me. It was a bit frustrating in that sense, but he's a nice guy. Yeah. But yeah, the, the in, unwillingness to confront issues. Yeah, I, I you, just think you, they, they weren't, the, it was it was a shame that there were no macroeconomists doing it, um, to be honest. But that's, I mean, economists don't, they don't do that. They don't do debate. You know, and uh, I, I remember reading a, a blog post about how the the it just looked at terms like rejoinder and reply and how they've declined in economics journals. Right. So there's no longer a debate. It's much more. I've done a thing using the accepted methods. Here it is. It could be economics or it could actually be something completely different, like a Victorian chimneys. But right. And it's like you don't have that kind of discussion as much anymore, uh, which I think is a real shame. But maybe that explains why they just weren't really willing. Peter was the only one willing and he obviously wasn't a macroeconomist. Um, but it was, uh, yeah. I don't know. How do you feel yeah. that debate, that debate went uh, on the substance? Do you just think it was not I, that fruitful? It wasn't particularly worthwhile. I mean, the reason <laughs> that I wanted to come up and do the talk was because I always admired you guys for sticking your necks out and forming a, a rival society. The whole post-crash economic mm. society was real courage by a group of students. And it's that's the first time anything like that had been done at a university since I did it in 1973 back at Sydney University. And one little anecdote you might not know is that there's a Manchester link because you guys did at University of Manchester. The conservative asshole who came out to Sydney University and turned our economics department from the sort of progressive Keynesian humanist that it was back in the up to the 1968, 69, when Bruce Williams turned up. Bruce Williams brought in two very conservative neoclassical economists uh, to teach and take over the subject. And Bruce Williams was a professor of economics at Manchester University. It can all be traced back to Manchester. So, it's, all, it's all their fault. It all goes back to Manchester. <laughs> yeah, that, that's where manufacturing in many ways began and it's where manufactured ideology also began. <laughs> Yeah, that's Steve, let's, give a, let, let's give a plug for you, Steve, on um, because I, I want you to to kind of bring everybody up to speed about how and to what extent you predicted two thousand eight. Well, I my I predicted it in a sense. It's what actually happened in nineteen ninety two, because if you look at the paper I wrote in the Journal of Post Keynesian Economics and published in nineteen ninety five, and there's a story behind why it took three years for the paper to be published. Uh, I'll tell Mike that later. <laughs> you have to guess who who was responsible for the long time delay. Um, but I, the model was included was model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, and that in, it generated a set of cycles which diminished and then rose afterwards and leading up to a crisis. And that was such a striking phenomenon that I said, uh, "Do I know Frank Stilwell? Frank Stilwell is why I'm a non-orthodox economist. One of my best friends." And uh, he's the one who exposed me to the first hole in neoclassical economics. There's a question from, uh, uh, who was that? P101 a moment ago. Anyway, um, so I built the model in 92, 95, and then in, I then got caught up in writing, you know, doing my PhD and uh, doing and, wrote, and writing uh, debunking economics. And I got involved in a fight in micro, in fact, over the theory of uh, competition. So I didn't look at the economic stuff over the macro for ages. And then I got asked to write an expert witness report on predatory lending in Australia, where some poor bastard who used to be an employee was then, the company was shut down. He was forced to be a self-employed contractor, a little of the garbage people who pushed him into the gig economy. And he got a house loan, housing loan, and he then failed six consecutive housing loans, all from one uh, predatory lender. And uh, then the seventh loan, they took his house and we fought to get the seventh loan reversed. So I went back to looking at the level of private debt, which is what was driving my Minsky model. 
And I made a throwaway comment, this comes back to the word exponential, a throwaway comment while I was writing my expert witness report that the debt to GDP ratio has been rising exponentially. Now, as an expert witness in Australia, you're even though you're paid for by one side, you're effectively an employee of the court. So you can't say anything which isn't empirically backed. So I thought, well, I'll look at the empirical data. It won't quite be exponential, but it'll be rising and that'll be OK. So I sat down, I wrote a mathematical routine to do the estimation of Australia's data rather than using an Excel spreadsheet, plotted the data and my jaw fell off. The correlation coefficient between the actual debt to GDP ratios, so not the level of debt, the ratio of debt to GDP, the correlation with a, with a, with a strict exponential was 0.98. And I went, holy shit, what's the American data look like? It was 0.92. And I went, Jesus Christ, first of all, the word's justified. And B, this trend can't continue. When it does break, and I could see the data, it was the highest level of private debt since World War II. I didn't have data before then. Uh, it's going to break. There'll be a crisis. Somebody has to warn about it. It has to be me, in Australia at least. So that's why I got into making the warning. So I first published a warning about it in the media because I knew I couldn't get a, a journal paper refereed in time in December of nineteen of, of 2005. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kahal, what's your next, what's your next, tell us, you tell us about your, um, your work situation because yeah, you're, you're, you're being me very much younger than I was when I turned into me. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, we were just chatting about it uh, b before before we went live, weren't we? But I've uh, recently yeah. started doing Share YouTube with the uh, full time. And uh, so, yeah, my, my channel, just in case anyone doesn't know, is called Unlearning Economics. And um, I started that during COVID, like, like a lot of people. I kind of started up YouTube and it seemed like there was a bit of a gap for what you might call progressive economics uh, that was done, you know, with uh, um, using sort of uh, proper methods and evidence and stuff and was progressive mm. and not kind of some of the Austrian stuff that you see, which I don't think is really very good uh, and not mainstream and also, you know, not just sort of Marxism. Um, but I thought, you know, he heterodox economists, post Keynesians, institutionalists, we have a lot uh, to offer. And I don't think anybody was really putting it out there. So anyway, that, that was when I decided to make the channel. Uh, but I was also working at LSE in the psychologi psychological and behavioral science department at the time, uh, which was my first job after after my PhD at Manchester. And uh, I was doing that while, while doing the YouTube channel. But it wasn't until uh, late last year that I finally decided to take the plunge. And now I'm like fully self-employed. Um, and yeah, just just doing this full time, this and book writing, um, and you know, trying to make a living. But it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty tricky. Uh, there's there's a lot of uncertainty about about your income. I think uh, it's, it's yeah, it's it's there something is, that you, yeah, you waited I'm... to take the plunge, didn't you, Steve? And uh, I guess that you probably had a bit more stability um, when you decided to do it well, than, than I do. Well, I don't know. No, my. my... Mine was a bit different. I mean, I should, by the way, I must say, guys, we're in envy mode here because I've been had my channel on YouTube. I don't know, fifteen years. Yours? How how long has yours been around, Carl? Uh, four. It's almost four years now. Almost four. Yeah. Okay. You have one hundred eighty-seven thousand subscribers, mm, which is yeah. extremely impressive. So, do you make any mm. revenue out of it? Like, because I gave up on YouTube for making revenue a long time ago. Yeah, so you you've got like the um, you've got the ad revenue that just comes straight through YouTube, and I didn't enable that until actually like a couple of years in because I'm an idiot. Uh, so it doesn't actually change anything. It's just that you connect it to your bank account. Uh, I think you have to be above a thousand subscribers and above a couple of maybe other metrics and hours watched or whatever yeah. to enable it. But then you start to get revenue just sort of passively from watches and clicks on the the adverts that show on youtube anyway so yeah there's that and then there's patreon obviously which is like uh pretty nice it's really is guaranteed income um it's the most stable source uh but even that kind of fluctuates right because mm, if yeah, you don't release it uh, yeah for a while um it depends with on the state of the economy as well right like um a lot of people lose their jobs and stuff and then they they have to unsubscribe from it but you you have to keep up the content to keep patreon kind of steady or or rising really um but then there's like the in the in video sponsorships right um because i i think you know truth be told 
I'd probably I'd rather not do them at all, but uh, I I don't edit my own videos. I'm crap at video editing, so I pay somebody to do that. I also pay like an animator. I pay people to do like all of the technical stuff, right? So I I like I I can't do any of that. I can only write the scripts and record it. Um, so really, I, I I need them. And um, yeah, those those kind of I've, I've done sponsors for like um like a news website and uh, sponsors for like a, um, a VPN as well, which is a very classic YouTuber one, right? But uh, so that that those are the main sources of income. But um, it all really just depends on keeping the content up, which is, you know, fine in a way, but it you do feel that temptation to just keep churning out low quality content, which is obviously most of what YouTube is, right? These days, right? You know, yeah. rea reactions or reactions or, uh, you know, just sort of Mr. Beast copies or something like that. You see these people upload constantly. They upload constantly and like they're getting really high views and, and they just like financially obviously must be really secure. So there is, it creates that tug. I, I, I don't think it's a great system and I don't think it's, that's an especially yeah. controversial thing to you say. Gotta, you gotta uh, bury yourself alive like Mr. Beast did and do economics from underground or something to get millions of subscribers. Yeah, so yeah. You, that's the problem. You, 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 you don't have time to do original research, and that's one reason that I don't do a lot of posting because mm. when you're doing original stuff, if you get distracted to post this and post that, sometimes it actually helps in terms of giving you new ideas, but you've got to then sit down and develop the ideas thoroughly, and that takes time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so what I how I interpret what uh, the subscribers that Kahal has on his site would you say 180,000, Steve? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that, yeah, that's it. So, so Jay Forrester would always tell me or ask me, he says, "Why are you writing for economics journals?" He said, "All you're doing is writing for other economists who don't care about the economy. They just care about economics articles and economics journals." And I said, "Well, you know, I have to get, you know, as a professor, that's what I have to do." He said, "What you should be doing is writing for the general public, the business community." He said, there are people out there that aren't professional economists who write any kind who care about this stuff and you've got to reach them. Now, he was telling me this before we had YouTube and, you know, really mm. the Internet and all that. So so today we have the ability to do that, to reach out to people interested mm. in economics, economic issues, but they're not professional economists in the orthodox tradition and what have you. And when I see 180,000 subscribers, that's 180,000 people who care about what you're saying. Right. Mm. And I bet you they're not all professional economists. So that gives me hope that we have alternative routes around the economics profession to get our message out. You know, mm. as Steve pointed out, Max Planck famously said, you know, science proceeds funeral by funeral. The profession is path dependent. There's such an installed base of neoclassical economists and neoclassical textbooks and what have you to just turn that around suddenly or break it free is ridiculous it's just not going to happen on any small time scale so we've got to go around them yeah mm. and i think social media outlets whether it's x twitter youtube whatever uh, provide hope that we can do that i think that was a major realization as well for for me us at rethinking economics and maybe steve the sort of we can't we can't go through them so we we'll have to go around them kind of thing and i think that yeah absolutely the, yeah. the internet's been so helpful in that for that and social media you know for all its flaws it is amazing that hundreds of thousands of people uh watch a video about economics and my videos are long and they're a bit boring i'll be honest with you like but i get comments saying you know i've taken notes on this i've watched it most multiple times and i'm yeah. like my students right. didn't used to do that so this is like <laughs> it's great right it, <laughs> yeah yeah. All right. Well, you, guys, you, I get, you know, you're looking at you, 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 you actually, you actually have in what one of them, plan to love obsolescence will kill us all. You have seven hundred and forty-eight thousand views, and that's, that's my best performing one. Slightly, yeah. yeah, slightly more views than you actually have subscribers. Now, mm -hmm. I'm getting, you know, about, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of when I, when I've, I haven't given a, a technical um, talk on the internet for a long, long time, and I haven't been recording conferences because I've been over here in Hungary for the last six months. But I was sort of disappointed to get sort of two to five thousand views when I've got four times as many subscribers. So you're doing extremely well. They're getting, in some cases, more views than subscribers. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. it's a good thing. It's a good metric that if you're getting more views than subscribers. I don't. I mean, the thing is, no, you I'm release not. more frequently. Yeah, but it also depends on the type of content. I mean, there's this guy, Alex O'Connor. 
uh, Cosmic Skeptic is his YouTube name. Um, and he's extre he makes extremely good videos. Uh, he's a really sharp guy, he talks about religion and, and philosophical issues. But he, he, on his normal videos, he would frequently overperform or perform roughly around his subscriber count. But he's just started a podcast, right? And um, these podcasts are really, really good. But for a long form chat, you see his metrics drop right down, right? And he's like, he's really good, consistently good. But it's just this type of thing. I don't think you get as many views as YouTube. You're looking at a fraction of your subscriber count. And they're, they're usually uploaded because they're, they are lower effort than scripting a video and, and, and releasing it. They usually um, release more frequently. And I think a higher frequency usually means lower views as well. So I, it's partly the yeah. type of content, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, and the other, and this is the... I got a, we got a right. question here. So um, this one's from Astrid. What is mm. the state of microeconomics? Is the rational agent thrown out the window and replaced by behavioral econ? What no, I mean, I, I, I don't think, I don't think, um, I suppose those are two different questions, really, but I don't think that the rational agent has been thrown out of the window entirely. It's still unfortunately the go to. No, I mean, it's still a central, take center stage in economics degrees, um, including, you know, master's level and maybe even beyond. But it also, so most people will learn largely rational stuff. But if you're going to create an economic model, you know, and you're not, a behavioral economist and it isn't a behavioral economics paper the, the go-to would still be the standard workhorse neoclassical model where you've got a basically rational agent right and the, the economist would just argue that that's not they're not looking at irrationality in that context they're looking at something else so um i think you know the state of microeconomics is probably better because there are more experiments and uh there's more data like i mentioned earlier and stuff um but in terms of the use of microeconomic theory i don't think there isn't a there isn't this is this goes back to what we were saying at the start right there isn't a behavioral theory there's 161 different biases that tweak the main theory so which one do you choose i mean pros prospect theory which i did my thesis on is arguably the one that's loss aversion like carmen tversky's type stuff that's arguably the main one but even that there are different versions of it right so it's like the the rational model is is one of its one of the reasons for its staying power, one of its perceived benefits is just that it's a standard core mm -hmm. model that you can just use again and again. And we don't have that in behavioral economics yet. Steve? The reason that where they use it is because it cuts out uh, any arg argument of agency by the government or any non-market force. Because the whole idea of rational expectations was you, each individual, has in their mind a model of the economy identical to the model that we've put you into. And hey, presto, because you have that model in your head, you completely neutralize any attempt by the government or any outside agency mm -hmm. to change the behavior of the system. So it's actually there not because it behaves human individual behavior at all. Its real function is to say the government can't do anything, get out, get out of the way. And it's the anti-government uh, bias of neoclassical economics. That's why they'll continue using it, despite the fact that it's an abject failure and it doesn't describe real human beings at all. There you have it, uh, Mike. <laughs> what's your uh, what are your so thoughts? So I've I've been arguing um, along with some of my uh, WPI colleagues and even Jay Forrester uh, before he passed. Although he um, he didn't word it the way I'm going to word it. And I think there is an opportunity to reformulate microeconomics using system dynamics, using Minsky or the various yeah. tools that are out there. And but you would instead of taking a deductive uh, top down and not in Steve's sense, top down, but the, the orthodox neoclassical approach of Descartes, you know, start with a theory to derive a testable hypothesis, download a data set and see if the numbers confirm the theory. You use a David Hume inductive pattern modeling approach, right? Where you start with a case study. And we, like Forrester used to do, go into companies and you know, model what, what they do, right? And uh, the interesting thing is real quick is he would find out that after talking to the marketing people and the finance people and the accounting people and the sales force and the shop floor guy, that everybody was doing something that was completely, I won't say rational, but made a lot of sense, right? There was nothing crazy going on here. And the people were well compensated for doing what they did. So at each part in the system, everybody was doing what seemed logical and you know made, made sense. But when you hooked everything together, the, the overall system behaved improperly. 
And then you could say, well, how would you redesign it to behave properly? So you could do that for various firms, various case studies, right? And then finding regularities among the cases, you'd have generic structures or real typologies. And if there were any uh, commonalities among those, those would be your general principles of microeconomics. And we would have accounting sectors and proper finance in these models, interacting with the real stuff, finding out what people really do when they, they price. Are you a price taker or a price maker? If you're a price maker, what do you do? Well, you say, here's my unit costs and here's the markup that we historically or traditionally use. And then you tweak that with all sorts of pressures from competitor prices or whatever. That's very different from a, a neoclassical model of pricing, for example. Mm. So we can do I, that. It's yeah. just a lot of work. We have, somebody's got to get busy and do it. <laughs> well, I, I have this thing to make it three times more work for you, Mike. If I came to you and I said, I'd like to sponsor um, your students and bring a team together, and that includes Kahal and Steve Keen and yourself and whoever else you want to bring into the team, and I want to say, hey, um, let's start with Descartes. Let's start with the deductive model. Let's model it. Let's start with the, then let's move on to the inductive model. Let's model Humean. Um, and then um, what about abductive? The simplest pathway. Okay, this is the perceived simplest pathway to, I don't know if it's an end goal or whatever, but that's Charles Sanders Pierce. Okay, so you've got those three forms of, of, of reasoning, the deductive, the abductive, and the inductive. Okay, is there a way to be able to model these and see how the three systems can come together or how we can derive answers out of the three of those systems. To build a model of inductive logic and deductive logic and so forth, is that what you're? Yeah, three independent models. And then how do you get the three models to communicate to each other or derive, oh, or der um, right? Well, if you're asking, can it be done in principle? Yeah, if somebody knows those domains and can precisely define the concepts, uh, we can we can certainly model them. Uh, John Sturman has a model of um, uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn's uh, structure of scientific revolutions, for example. Yeah. Oh, right. I'd like so, to see that. Yeah, and, and actually, there's a follow-up model, whatever. So there's a whole and a whole bunch of rhetoric around it. It's very interesting. We had one guy who would come to the System Dynamics Conference every year and show us his models of mystic experiences. No lie. He was an engineer, but he was into this thing. And, and But the point is, he defined all his concepts and was running simulations of mystic experiences. So you can, you can do that sort of thing, but you have to be precise in the definitions of the concepts, and then we can write equations. I guess where I'm pushing for is to say, how do you synthesize these various different um, pockets of reasoning? Because if you can't get the systems to talk to each other, which in a, in a human experience, we actually do have the systems that talk to each other. My deductive and inductive and abductive all kind of are part of, you know, one larger description of what human consciousness is. So it seems to me that you know, unless we're, I mean, it's fine to, to build out one particular form of reasoning and, you know, base a, a, a model on inductive information gathering, but we know that's not sufficient either. So, I mean, the bigger question and the challenge to the discipline as a whole is to say, how do you take those three categories and how do you get those categories to theoretically, just theoretically, how would you set up the, the experiment to, to have them you know, cross pollinate and, and and talk to each other. This, so, this sounds like we have to sit, uh, Steve or I, or so, somebody, one of our modelers has to sit with what a philosopher of science, uh, is this epistemology? Uh, where you get into how, knowing about Theory knowing. I think the, 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 problem, the, uh, the, the problem there, Dave, Dan, the, Dan, the problem there is that we, when you're talking about scientific revolution, you're talking about an evolutionary process. And mm -hmm. I think that's, so system dynamics can do dynamic processes. But doing evolutionary mm. processes is not something that fits within the system dynamics paradigm. I'd like to see that model, Mike, that Sturman model you mentioned. Yeah, I'll send you the papers. Anybody who wants them, just fire me an email. I'll send them along. That'd be good, yeah. Final little thing I want to have a quick chat with Carl, but we're running up to a close five minutes to go. Um, I met you, you guys also got Deborah Mulemaz to put on a special course. Uh, oh, yeah. Tell us the story about that, because that shows what economics departments are like. Mm. Yeah, so th this was, yeah, this was a shame. So we, um, 
uh, Devry Mulemas, a, a lecturer at Manchester, and he he taught. He was a, a heterodox economist of post Keynesian, but he just taught normal macro in the in the in the neoclassical uh, way because that's what he was, you know, obviously had to do. Uh, but then he he kind of joined our cause a little bit because he obviously he had some agreements with the post crash economic society, and one thing that we we got him to do was to put on a completely voluntary module in the evenings. Uh, called Bubbles, Panics, and Crashes. And uh, it was really good. Uh, it was very post-Keynesian. There was a lot of history, uh, kind of Charles Kindleberger type stuff, you know, uh, going back through the history of financial crises, looking at endogenous money, some critiques of the uh, mainstream models. There's a bit of Marx in there as well. And um, it was really good. And it consistently had sort of, bear in mind, this is in the evenings, not for credit. It consistently had 20 to 30 students you know not just us from post crash but like other people as well um and it was it was uh yeah it was really loved and then the the, the department said that they <laughs> they said that they put it on um they said that they they'd uh put it on as a, a real module the year after uh and then sort of uh ended up reneging on their on their promise and uh just uh allowing devrim's contract to expire instead so we thought we were going to get, you know, the post-crash economic society. We thought we were going to get this crash module put on. And we were like, you know, well, we've, we've almost achieved, you know, our goal if, if that module's on the curriculum. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't to be, sadly. Uh, they just sort of let him go instead. And then uh, then then we, we didn't get typical. thought about financial crises either. And, and I think, yeah, that has, I mean, that pattern with heterodox economists, it does, it does get, it does get repeated. You you do see it again and again. Sometimes it's it's even worse. Sometimes they you know there are his times when they've been kind of forced out much more much more uh, aggressively as well. But basically, you're you're not likely to get tenure if you are a heterodox economist, and you're not likely to get heterodox modules taught on syllabus and, and syllabi, and you're not likely to get uh, uh, heterodox papers published in in any major journal either. Well, this is that's exactly the experience years, that I had right? through my academic mm. career. And mm. uh, like just a bit more background on Devrim, uh, because Devrim did his PhD at Manchester because he thought he was going to be going to a heterodox department, because in the past history, that was dominated by a guy called Ian Steedman, who was a mm. Srafigan economist, and they yeah. used an input-output uh, dynamic, still equilibrium focused, unfortunately. Steve, Stephen and I had a fight over that at one stage, um, but uh, still the Shraffian, very very uh, uh, non-orthodox. And then when he got there, it was all DSGE. So he built a DSGE model. He hated the shit, but he did it. So he was capable of doing highly technical neoclassical mm. work. And he worked there for eight or nine years, I think. And then after the course was put forward, they effectively sacked him. And this is what happens inside an economics department. Mm. They drive non-orthodox people out. So the very first thing I did when I got my position at Kingston was I hired Devrim. And yeah. uh, the quality of the work he does now in dynamics is off the scale. And this is the sort of stuff we should be doing. And the last place it's going to happen in is a neoclassical economics department. Mm. So great job, good guys. to you guys. Great, good, great to you, Carl, for starting rethinking. It's marvelous. It's still going. Any yeah. student who wants to keep their critical thoughts, join rethinking economics Please. or start one at your university. Please. Okay. Yeah. And, and you can thank you can thank for Carl for the fact that it exists. Yeah, and thanks as well to Steve for steering me uh, towards the uh, the the criticism of mainstream economics. Uh, you know, it's over, it's over a decade ago now. Jesus. Okay, guys, I want to. <laughs> You've got no right to. I'm over seventy, mate. You can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining us this week, and I want to thank our special guest. And I also want to thank Mike for volunteering to wear the hat next week. We hit our goal. Uh, we, we've got the likes, and so next week Mike's going to be wearing a special hat. And uh, tune in next week to find out exactly what that's going to be. And uh, have a good week. Thanks, everybody.